Hi, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, we have to start because the recording starts at 10 30. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so my name is Richard Brannett, and my colleague is Mark Lawrence. And just by a quick introduction, Mark will introduce us himself. And both of us have been co chair of what's called the e learning task force for the ABA, which is to help lawyers figure out ways to deliver legal services online. And uh, I also started the virtual one of the first virtual law firms in the country, and I have a company that provides a virtual law firm platform to help lawyers deliver legal services online. And my current project, uh, which Mark teaches in, and I'm co-director of with Stephanie Kimbrough, is a thing called the Center for Law Practice Technology, which is to help train, really, lawyers who are going to solo practice and, and practices of any kind for 21st century practice. So uh, this is a longer presentation, but I'm going to describe how we developed this curriculum. This is a quick lecture on kind of curriculum design and our experience in delivering these courses and the reaction that we get from the students, which I thought you'd be interested in. But to back up for a minute, uh, the conceptual foundation of where we're going with this, what I call this curriculum, which is a different kind of training that uh, law students usually get in law school is built on uh, this kind of conceptual foundation. When you take a look at other organizations, including SafeArth, which is a major law firm, the Mayo Clinic and the Four Seasons, what's characteristic of these service organizations is that they basically use systems, technology, and people in a different way so that they have consistency of quality all the time. They basically create procedures and systems and technologies so that um, <coughs> They have a service delivery system which delivers services better, quicker, and faster, and responds to what we call the demands of a new consumer generation, which really wants, I'll say this again, fast food rather than a gourmet meal. And uh, if you look deeper into the, what's really happening uh, in terms of the business model for law firms, a law firm is built on what we call the solution shop model. This is straight out of Clay Christensen, if you've ever read him. The solution shop model means that every problem is unique. And the talent that we have in our law firm becomes our basic asset. And therefore, we charge by the hour. And we look at every problem as if it were unique. And we, we pull together every skill that we have to make sure that we have the perfect solution to that problem. And of course, law schools. Because we define the practice of law today. Practice of law means the solution shop model. And law schools exclusively train their law students to fit into the solution shop model, which works well for the large law firm, which is a solution shop for that particular marketplace. But you have another marketplace, which is both the latent market and the consumer market, served by solos and small firms where the solution shop model is really not necessarily appropriate all of the time. There, the business model is what we call a value chain business model. Limited legal services, high use of technology, high use of paralegals, systematized around a particular service. So you have an immigration firm, a bankruptcy firm, they don't do 18 different specialties. They do one specialty. What the consumer is looking for is a series of processes which gets them a solution which is better than going to LegalZoom. LegalZoom is a value chain business model. And they're eating for lunch the business of solos and small firms. Because what they've done is refine the processes and providing a good enough solution. Not the best solution, but a good enough solution. And this is a, a part of a longer lecture. I only got 20 minutes, so I'm going <laughs> to kind of race through some of this. So the value chain business model, conceptually, is like a factory. You have inputs. And you come out with an output, which is a legal service for a fixed fee at an affordable price. And the inputs are technology, the lawyer's judgment, paralegal processes, checklists. Think in terms of the minute clinic. Not for every kind of solo and small firm, but many of them, we argue, really should uh, adopt 
this kind of business model. If you have a confusion of business models, then you have a confusion of what your educational design is. Because in fact, what's really happening is all of our law schools are training, all of our law schools are training everybody for the solution shop model. But, you know, 75% of law schools, the students are going to be in solo as a small firm. They don't get the skills that they really need to be effective to implement the value chain model. And that's what we see is the gap in legal education so far. So different markets require different models. We're going to post this so we don't have to bother reading it up here. This is my point about legal education, that you have to understand where your students are going and what market they're going to serve in in order to prepare them for the skills they need to be effective in that particular market. Uh, we see solos and small firms evolving towards this value chain business model concept, particularly as limited legal services as a concept also begins to expand, uh, which needs to be supported by particular kinds of technology and human resource configurations and processes that are perceived as and also marketing skills and web development skills and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, let me just move. So when we talk about lean law, which is a characteristic of both large law firms and small law firms, general counsel are also pressuring law firms to do more with less, get more value, don't charge us for associates. We don't want to see written memorandum any longer. We just want to get what we really need to solve our legal problem. So that's what the value chain concept is all about. Uh, attorneys are really project managers, both in large firms and small firms. They need project management skills. They need what we call process management technologies. Uh, if you're doing legal work and can't break down the matter into its components, you don't know what your costs are. If you don't know what your costs are, you can't offer fixed pricing. So if uh, I use an analogy, if I could uh, contract to buy a house, with a contractor, it's a million dollar house. I'm gonna give a, I'm not gonna do a cost plus contract for my house. I'm gonna expect the contractor to give me a fixed price. If that contractor doesn't know what the components of the cost, he's gonna lose a lot of money. I have no patience for lawyers who say, I can't estimate what this task is gonna cost. Sure, there are certain kinds of legal work which uh, may be unestimatable because it's uh, long-term jury trial, it comes to litigation, but for many kinds of more routine work, if you have enough information, you can estimate the cost and you can move towards fixed pricing. If you don't have fixed pricing, you won't survive as a lawyer. In order to get fixed pricing, you have to have both skills and a knowledge base to figure out what that pricing is. So, project management is a skill that we think lawyers need, figuring out process maps. You know, what do you do in every, in every step? If you have a process map, you can increase quality because you can standardize your service. If you know how to collect information, you can feed back the information into your service delivery system and constantly improve it. These are concepts that industry uses all the time, but it's totally disassociated from the service delivery systems that lawyers deliver to clients. Uh, the skills that we see is this is just some of the skills that law schools don't teach their students. Therefore, they're training them not to be competent in the environment in which they're, they're moving into. And it's not, it's not to say that somehow they'll learn this when they get out of law school. They won't learn it. They will fail. And they are failing. They're failing now. And we have interlopers like LegalZoom and so forth that continue to figure out ways to eat up market share. We have millions of new clients which have different behaviors which require different responses. I mean, I hear all the time, oh, uh, I don't want to deal with my client on the net because I need to get him into the office so I can talk to the client face to face. The reality is the clients don't want to talk to you. They'd rather text you. <laughs> and, you know, and, that, and the older lawyers don't get it. You know, they say, oh, I've got to get them into the office. But people don't want to take a day off from work and go into the office and spend an hour talking to the lawyer. They basically want to text the lawyer. We have a huge latent market, which we all know about. 75% of America can't afford legal fees. So the legal profession is only serving a small part. We don't get to serve this latent market until we come up with these value chain approaches. There's a huge market there, a market ready to be tapped. 
if lawyers or anything <coughs> can create it and can figure out a way to do it. So what we did was, we took Susskind's book, Tomorrow's Lawyers, which we think should be required reading for everybody in this business, and we took there his list of disruptive technologies, <coughs> and then we built a course around each of the disruptive technologies. Because we believe that the disruptive technologies will actually lead to job titles and confidence is not only in use in small firms, but also job titles in larger organizations. Like you'll have a legal document automation specialist in an outsourcing company or a large organization. So if we can empower our students in their entering resumes with some additional job titles, it will give them a differentiator against their other kinds of students. And this is a map, Red <laughs> Susskind. This is a map of technologies. And uh, the companies are companies that are delivering these technologies. We build courses around each of these technologies, <coughs> which we call law practice technologies. And these are the courses. And these are the courses offered by the Center for Law Practice Technology, which is affiliated with Florida Coastal School of Law, third tier law school. 90% of its students end up in solos and small firms. So it's a perfect strategy for them. This is a distance learning curriculum, meaning that it's pre-recorded courses plus a high level of interactivity on an online platform. We did that because the people that we wanted to teach this don't live in Jacksonville, Florida, where Coastal is located. It's a nationwide faculty of nationwide uh, thought leaders. And uh, we'll make this offer. We'll make available for free a good group of these lectures and the way to get to it. I'll tell you how to get to it in a week. Go to digital-lawyer.com, which is our dedicated website. I'm going to set up a group just named Allie. You register, you get into the group that will, you can access the recorded sessions and the curricula for each of the courses, uh, which are here. So what we did was we did a course on lawyers as entrepreneurs. I do this with Lisa Herrera, some of you may know her. She's active in the clinical movement. The Ethics of Online Legal Services, Will, Will Hornsby, who's a nationwide expert in it. Social Media and Law Practice by Stephanie Kimbrough. Document Automation Applications by Mark Lauritsen, who's an expert. Uh, I did a course on legal process outsourcing because that's another career line. Uh, that's a, so some of the courses, the one credit courses, uh, empower folks for jobs in larger organizations, whereas uh, we have a three credit core course, it's not listed here, on law practice management, where the students end up with an operational business plan. So when they get past the bar, they're ready to go into practice immediately because they're experiencing software. They actually create a project plan. The project plan gets uh, juried. We pick the best of them. All this is essentially done online. Uh, we're doing a course on legal expert systems. Legal process redesign, we got SafeArt, which is the leading law firm in the country that's thinking about these issues. And then one on access to justice, because there's a confluence between uh, technology and the Legal Services Corporation, which is making a real big emphasis on technology. So we think there are technology jobs for people in the legal services environment, because people who have those skills are harder to come by. And then we have our own research and development component looking at some of these issues. So if you go to Digital Dash Lawyer, there's a description of both the courses, lots of background, uh, how we put together the curriculum, and why we think that this is really preparation for 21st century practice. Not obviously to replace the whole JD curriculum, but a portion of the, the credits that students take. We actually created a certificate program. So students take all 12 credits like a certificate of law practice technology. But we unbundled it because some students won't pay the whole thing, they'll just have particular interests. So we wanted to build that flexibility into it. Uh, I've used my 20 minutes. You've got time. Okay. Uh, no, we, we wanted to, we'll reserve some time at the end of this uh, for questions because we want to get some feedback and try and get some discussion going. I'm going to turn this over to you. I was going to say, while we're transitioning, if anyone has reactions or questions to what Richard has said so yeah. far, this is a good time, because we're, we're way ahead of schedule, so okay. there's no rush. Okay. Any questions? 
reactions to what he's doing. Yeah, right. He talked about a three credit course on practice management, right? Right. How, the whole, is the whole thing on online? And yeah, the, the lectures are online, but you have to have under 306 uh, ABA standards uh, a high level of interactivity. So there's one live session online every week. The others are pre-recorded lectures. But on the live sessions, we give both the mini lecture and have an opportunity for discussion and then there are a discussion group. So it's a classic distance learning course which meets ABA standards. Mm -hmm. So what we can, we're gonna make available is some of the pre-recorded content, because I think you might find that interesting. And uh, you know, for a three credit course, it's 45 sessions, just like a regular three credit course. We've done maybe 30 lectures and there'll be 15 live sessions. And there's, there's lots of other exercises in there. There's essays. We, have to, we actually have the students build their own personal website Mm -hmm. as a way of uh, substituting or adding to their own resume. So when they do projects like document automation and so forth, they can put links to their own projects. So they can show an employer that they've actually produced a project which is software-based or dynamically based or a business plan or a marketing plan or a social media policy for a law firm. So they can display their work projects on their own dynamic resume. So for many students, they have never built a website before. And we don't do it from scratch. We use some tools that's not rocket science. We use uh, a platform. It's free. And uh, uh, we got really good response from them. It was good. And it, it, this is an, a work in progress. We only, we're only offered this course the second time. We started offering courses only in January. We're still in development of some of the courses, but we'll have a full 12 credits done by January 2015. Given the glacial pace of getting curricular changes, such as these at many law schools, if not most right. law schools. Right. What would you think of the concept of making these kinds of skill training available in an intense bar view type parallel or very early bridge the gap CLE work? Bridge the gap CLE. Uh, you probably have to do it for free. Uh, the CLE market has its own dynamic. You right. can't get CLE credit for law practice management, although we're going to try and get an ABA resolution. Well, I'm, not, I'm thinking more, I mean, oh, yeah. not so much that for the credit. Oh, well, you're, you're but, a different point. Yeah, I was in only terms of once I get oh, yeah. out of my law school, I know I need this, but it wasn't offered yeah. at my right, law right. school. Right, right, yeah, I get that. Uh, yeah, we're going to probably do that uh, post, but I was, we were interested in building this into the JD curriculum. Oh, yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, and uh, the reason I went to Coastal was uh, I knew that I could drive this to the faculty because of the nature of their governance mechanism, mm -hmm. you know, so that was important. So because these courses we can export to international law schools, outsourcing companies. So there are other markets for this, not just JD, but I wanted to make sure that we were tapping into the JD tuition flow credit piece, uh, which is, yeah, but I think those are all possible. We're now, once we have the whole product, we're going to begin to roll it out that way. We have more questions. I know that Florida Coastal does a lot of evaluation and assessment of right. almost everything they do. That's true. This is still new, but right. what are the assessment success um, the, mechanisms? I'll tell you that what, that Chris, uh, that's why it's a work in progress. The students are challenged by the distance learning, and you know, it broke because of the demographic. Mm -hmm. We find that we have to provide more structure. Uh, more structure, more support, you know, they get anxious. Uh, it's also out of their comfort zone. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing a business plan, you really have to go into the world and get facts, not legal facts, but real facts. And we find, you know, these are college graduates, but they don't know how to do social science research yeah. and how to estimate a market and where the data is from. High anxiety. So uh, it's, it, you got to keep so on improving it. Yeah. And are you using the desire to learn? Yeah, we're using D2L, use which is buggy. Yeah, okay. I have some problems with that, yeah. too. Okay. Yeah, yeah we're you. using D2L. Mm -hmm. It's better. Uh, back with there, Richard. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, how, would, how would this work uh, uh, for undergraduates? I don't, um, I don't think there's much market for undergraduates yet. I think undergraduates, uh, I mean, this is an opinion. This, I just haven't thought about it, but what do you think? Well, I, I ask because our law school is very seriously uh, exploring, uh, offering undergraduates for people who ultimately are gonna get careers in law but maybe don't want a JD is the way we're doing it. So how much of this, yeah, how much of this? Yeah, we think they're expanding careers for 
BA degrees in what we call law-related careers. There's a major market there. The, these programs are only available to two and three L's because it's distance mm -hmm. learning. In, in uh, ABA rules, you can't uh, make it available at first. But, I, but you can repackage this for undergraduates. It's almost an extension of, well, there are definitely, there's no question there are new, uh, growing career lines as a diversification strategy for law school. Mm -hmm. We have to get into that channel. You know, you have to, it's a good idea. There's some more chairs. It's a good idea. More chairs, by the way, for folks who are yeah. may not be comfortable down in the front of you. If you want to get your way down, you can sit have an actual chair. How do you recommend getting student buy-in that they need this, or getting people to register in the first place? I tried to drop a similar, yeah. uh, just a single session class in another skills class last fall, and I felt with the huge chunk of the people that they couldn't really get mm -hmm. over the hump in terms of why this was even relevant. Okay. So. Um, yeah, well, we are promoting it. We are, the classes were filled up, and then the student, you know, will depend on what kind of reaction we have from the students. And getting buy-in from students in other schools is another whole issue, because they don't, they're not aware how this really fits. I mean, they don't know about tomorrow's lawyers, they don't know about Susskind's work, they don't know about this thinking. They get their idea of what being a lawyer is like from TV, they don't understand the reality of law practice. These are people who are going to have to solo in small firms. It's a huge disconnect between the reality I'm going to law school in the reality of law practice, in my opinion. So, I, I don't know, I don't have the answer to all that, but I think you're absolutely right. Uh, you got to figure out a way to make it relevant. I, I, and we know the students know. talk about it, and if the employers talk about it, and uh, it, this is like an early stage development. It's the only way I can describe it. I've been, I've been in this role once, once or twice before, where I was like, Five years ahead. I started the paralegal business in the whole United States. I had the first paralegal training institution. And uh, went out to lawyers. They said, oh, we can't use paralegals. I mean, they didn't know what it was. And these were in large firms. It took like two and a half years before they began to understand it. And 10 years later, it mainstreamed. So I, I think we're at the very early stages of this. And you really got to build some pieces. And even like this document automation stuff that we work on, I made a presentation to a partner 10 years ago and showed him how much productivity he would save. And he said, why would I want to save time? I'm building my time on time. <laughs> so, the nature of the beast, it will happen. Here's the thing. In the fullness of time, this will happen. Every law school will have this kind of training component as part of the law practice management skills components that their law school will be face to face. But lots of different iterations from it. We're really at the very beginning of this. It goes beyond law, this single course of law practice management taught by, taught by a, a, a lawyer who just happens to run a law practice, who's an adjunct. Uh, we, we did do an article. We did a survey of all 220 law schools through our division to try and evaluate how many law schools were teaching courses and how extensive they were in law practice technology. And we only got 40 responses, of which 20 didn't qualify. From the 20, we called out 10 that really had committed programs, including Vermont Law School and Georgetown, Christian Maynard. So it's going to be an article Law Practice Management Magazine in the July issue. So we are definitely at an early adopter stage to go beyond uh, some isolated courses to try and build in as part of the core competence that students have on the intersection of technology and law. So it will grow. OK, we'll have more time for questions near the end, I believe. And I'm going to turn to something a little more specific. Like Richard, I'm a re-entrant educator. I spent 15 years here as director of clinical programs and heading up various kinds of research around technology in the, in the 80s and 90s. Um, and my, my recent obsession is with decision making, with choice. So I'm going to describe a, a new course that I'm teaching this fall at, over at Suffolk Law School uh, in which students are going to build applications to support choices. And the idea is that a lot of what lawyers do, in addition to working in factories or kind of manufacturing style practices, which we think are, are growing, a lot of the jobs lawyers perform are, are involve choice. Making choices, helping people make choices, influencing the choices of other people. So it seems natural to build a course around it. Obviously, both clients and, and self-helpers have to make lots of decisions among selections, among options. And lawyers in litigation and in their business and other aspects of their practice are constantly balancing things, trading off considerations, making decisions. And we haven't yet paid much attention to how technology can help in that process. 
let alone the pedagogical possibilities <coughs> of engaging students in building applications that support these kinds of decisions. So there's a long tradition, it's somewhat narrow, of courses in which students build applications. So we have Judson here from New Orleans who is doing some courses in which students code. But going back into the early 80s, uh, Brigham Young and Chicago Kent were some of the leaders. They would maintained courses of this nature. We had some here at Harvard. Stanford had an early uh, effort in this area with Paul Brest, who later became dean on expert systems. Northeastern, Don Berman and Carol Hafner were leaders in AI and law. Uh, and then there was a new group that came in in recent years. Uh, there's Wayola. Uh, Brian Donnelly is here from, from Columbia. I've been teaching a course for a couple of years at Suffolk called Wiring in an Age of Smart Machines. Um, and, and helping Rich in Florida with, with some of the existence courses, which also involve application development. And Georgetown has gotten a lot of press for their Iron Tech Lawyer competition. And thanks to uh, Jessica and Ron and others at Chicago Kent, there's a whole new cohort of schools coming online that are adopting this model. So what I want to do is, we, we sometimes refer to it as apps for justice, where students are engaged not only in learning through making things, but building tools that actually can help improve access for other people by putting these applications online. And uh, they, they use tools like AJ, which some of you saw yesterday, and tools like HotDocs to develop the templates, or RapidDocs in the case of Florida Coastal, accessible application development platforms for non-programmers. So you're really exposing people to the, the discipline of software engineering without having to understand how to code in C Sharp or, or Perl or uh, Python or something like that. And very, I think it's quite successful. And my goal, at least in this next effort, is to go beyond what we've done in these courses so far, which have mostly been constructing guided interviews, interactive questionnaires on the one hand, and automated documents, intelligent templates, and get into the question of how do we support choice? Because I think it turns out that choice is, is a whole different cognitive activity than rule-based uh, decision-making or, or uh, flow-charting of questions. It involves balances of considerations as opposed to algorithms. And, and, and figuring out how that works is quite, quite interesting, I think, and, and uh, fruitful from a pedagogical point of view. And you can think of choice as being a special kind of mental work, right? It's a form of decision-making. There's lots of decisions when and where and how many that don't involve choices necessarily. Uh, but choices are really a, a special form of, of cognitive activity where you're, you're, you're deciding among a, a set of options. You've got possibilities, alternatives you're considering. They differ in a number of ways you care about. Some are better in this way than this way. And so it's a combination of evaluating your options and evaluating how much you care about the different way in which these options may vary. And about, about 10 years ago, I, I had a series of epiphanies where I say, wow, how come there isn't a universal tool uh, online somewhere where I can just go and throw a problem like that at it and, uh, and engage with other people make, to make decisions. So that's kind of what I'm trying to focus on. One aspect of choice making involves factual uncertainty. So uh, what, what, what do you think will happen? What are the various possibilities? So you're trying to decide whether to sue in state or federal court. This is an, an ancient grid someone may put together. Right? You're dealing with questions and what's, what's my chances? Maybe I'll do better in state court but the actual damage is probably will be less. On the other hand, it's going to take one year to actually receive uh, recovery of my damage. If I go this way, where it will take two years here. And you provide some sort of discounted present value analysis and come up with you know, the anticipated value to make a choice. Right? So that's, that's dealing with various forms of factual uncertainty. And there's more sophisticated one, ways where you're, you've got sort of a whole bouquet of possibilities, but different, different outcomes in their respective percentages which you can total up. And it turns out there's relatively decent software that's been around for 20 years to support this, tools like Triage, that came out of here in Boston, uh, or a more simplified thing, Precision Tree, which is a, a set of Excel edits. So that, I think that's, that's kind of covered. But there's, there are disciplines, there are books, there are materials about it. The other aspect of choice, which I mentioned a while ago, is, is the, the value trade-off issue, right? Where it's not a question of uncertainty. You know what's going to happen. You're choosing an apartment. You have three apartments, right? They're right there in front of you. But this one's got a better view. This one's closer to the subway. This one has parking. And you're going, ah, on the one hand, on the other hand, how do I balance? And that's what you might refer, I call uh, preferential dissonance. 
where either in your own head you've got you're, you're tugged in different directions, or you've got other people involved, and people have different perspectives. And software for managing that is a little hard to come by. Um, this is a, a scan of an ancient document I think I created here way back in 1985. We had a project called Project Pericles. And we were trying to decide what word processing software should be. <laughs> should we settle on, right? So this is literally hand, <laughs> hand typed and hand, and hand drawn. And we were doing between SAMNA. Some of you remember SAMNA and Final Word. I don't see many people not here. <laughs> uh, WordStar, of course, people know. I think we ultimately settled on Zyrbic, which wasn't even on this, on this list. But it illustrates this idea that you've got a bunch of factors. Hey, does it do century? You know, can we, does it actually handle margins? Uh, uh, can we scroll horizontally? Um, but you're not just dealing with how well does the product do it, but how much do we care, right? How desirable is that feature relative to other features? And uh, you, know, you can do this in an Excel spreadsheet. This was uh, about 10 years ago. We were working with the Legal Services Corporation. We convened a, a national uh, conference to consider what technologies to use in, in kind of a shared platform for online document assembly. And we had about a dozen vendors respond, and we brought half of them to New York for uh, a beauty contest. And we came up with various ways to try and mix and match. This doesn't have the actual data in it. But some of you have probably done this, right? You're choosing a vendor to hire or a product to buy. So you've got a grid of, of choices and you've got factors or criteria. And you rate them perhaps on a scale of 0 to 10 or some other scale. But you also have this notion of weights, right? Certain things are more important. The fact that a vendor does better on X is twice as important as doing better on Y. So you can do that. And that's painful to construct, right, in Excel, <laughs> especially if you want to go three-dimensionally, right? You want to just not have this person's perspective, but behind it, you know, Jane and Sue and Frank, everybody's got a different take. So, uh, or you can just do a simple word table. This was an example, again, this was in Suffolk Law School, I was helping them about 10 years ago, decide about case management for the clinics. Classic, I mean, classic, you know, there's a committee that has to make a, make a decision. You get vendor literature, you talk to other schools, you come up with what, what are, what are the current choices? Why do we care about them? And you start identifying factors that differentiate them. Maybe you do it on a blackboard or a whiteboard with your committee meeting. And you, finally, you, you reach a consensus about it, and then you come back next week and make a decision and someone's erased the, the whiteboard. <laughs> it's like, uh-oh, you know, we, well, I thought we had that, that nailed. So I was dealing with all these questions. There, there have been tools, like this is one called Comparion Suite, that aim somewhat at this, uh, this kind of problem. But there's a relative vacuum of good tools to do this. It's mostly handcrafted word, uh, word tables, spreadsheets, whiteboards, other kinds of things people put together to make choices, especially in a, in a group. Um, you can find online tools like Find the Best, which is pretty good at giving you lots of data about choosing a business school to go to, for instance. And, but it doesn't get to the question of how do I balance, how do I actually manage the trade-offs in a way that feels uh, rational to me. And finally, there's this question of the, the processes of choice making. I don't know about you, but I've been in so many uh, com uh, committees and, and groups over the years making decisions, who to hire, where to, where to locate, what, which, which product X to buy, whether, when to switch from you know, Word 2007 to Word 2010 or whatever. And uh, the whole process is really messed up in most cases, <laughs> right? People, are, people come to meetings, you got talking at each, each other, they, they have private agendas, um, and again, you, 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 you reach a point of, of clarity and then you break up and return two weeks later only to have to reestablish that. And then you realize after you've gotten the product, oh, we forgot this factor, because no one, no one thought to consider uh, this particular dimension of, of comparison. And so you can, ideally, there's, there's kind of a natural life cycle, a project management approach to choice making, which makes sense. But we don't tend to have technology to support that kind of life cycle. So again, I, I found myself dealing with this uh, about 10 years ago and saying, wow, what would an ideal choice management system look like? And what would, what would be some of the characteristics? And there's a lot of things you really want, right? You want something that was persistent. So when, you, when you're making a decision, you're making evaluations, you could record it and store it and have it come back later, right? Uh, you want it to be transparent so you can see how people evaluate things and where they differ. 
and how the products are good or bad. It should be easy to use, accessible, all these, all these good things. It should be fun. There should be some kind of a, uh, a resource, ideally online, where I can go and say, I'm making a choice. Help me through the process. Let me, let me identify what options I'm considering. Let me identify what factors differentiate them. And let me record the different perspectives I have and my colleagues have on this choice. And it guides me through a process so when we're done thinking about it and deliberating and collaborating about this deliberation, we actually come to a, as good a choice as we can. So I set myself that task. Ideally, it would also be universal. One conclusion I came to was that choice making, the, the underlying grammar, uh, or even the geometry of choice making, is pretty universal. Whether it's a legal choice, or choosing a car, or a camera, or what school to go to, or what nursing home to put grandma in, <laughs> all these things, there's an underlying uh, systematicity to it, that if you could get the right tool, you could capture that. So I began, to, I, my, my original concept with the idea of a choice box, a pretty ugly representation here. But it's essentially a three-dimensional spreadsheet, right, where you, the columns are the options you're choosing among, the rows are the factors, and the, the, the slices are the perspectives. So we actually used this at a startup like, like Pretty Cool, All About Choice, designed to uh, eventually commercialize a version of this idea. So we, had, we were choosing a law firm to handle our some more intellectual property work at the beginning. We had a couple firms we were choosing among, and we found ourselves debating about, well, this, this firm seems to have more expertise, but these guys are much more convenient. These guys are very uh, compatible with us, you know, personality-wise, where I'm not sure I could work with this person. Uh, how much do they cost per hour? And the, the typical kind of balance of things that differentiate them. And, but the point was, we would each assess them differently. So you needed to have more than one layer in this thing. And of course, we also have different opinions about the relative importance of compatibility versus tech savviness or what it may be. So this seemed like a, a good way to capture all those dimensions of variation you might have in a choice. And I was saying, wouldn't it be cool if you could have something like this online that anybody could get for free, open it up, and just create as many rows, columns, in fact, and, and options as, as necessary. You could have sponsored links that might provide some sort of support for it that would be textualized to it. You provide various kinds of reports of the thing in progress and wizards that guide you through it. So that's what I began spending far too much time on. Uh, you can imagine this, this can be skinned in various ways. So this is a, a kind of an option pad approach, right? It need not be numbers, by the way. It can be qualitative differentiators. And you can have some kind of ordinal calculus behind it that can figure out based upon what Allison, Jared, and Susan think, what's the best place to hold a particular staff retreat. Right, we gonna, we'll say we're going to Boston. Uh, once again, you can have contextualized resources and other kinds of, and maybe even paid sponsorships where someone, you know, the cake meeting planners wants to be in front of you and, and argue for why the cake's the best place to hold your meeting. So it seemed to have a lot of promise. I even created these paper models, you know, because the idea was this should be a kind of a virtual device that you can you can build and manipulate. You know, you want to be able to turn it around and take take a look at different slices. Um, and conceptually, though, it's really this three-dimensional box where you've got uh, some sort of representation of the relative goodness of, of options from someone's perspective. In this case, Jane is in the front, uh, and the relative importance. So the height of these boxes. Jane cares much more about interface and features in general than ease of learning. And then you can think, logically, making a good choice is kind of melting down these ingots of goodness. And seeing on the whole, it looks like for her at least, Ace comes out best. So this is what I've been working on. Uh, it's still largely in the lab. And so, for instance, for a choosing an apartment, you've got Jane and Tom, they're gonna to share an apartment. Uh, they've got different assessments, I mean, affordability, uh, um, square footage or relatively uh, uh, fixed known uh, factors that are not subjective, they're objective factors. The quality of the view, you know, how, how do I like the view from this part? Because we differ about what we care about. Our approximately beach may be different. So again, you can capture the degrees of, of preference on, on several levels. And we have all kinds of alternative interfaces. This is what's called a slide box, where you can manipulate things and, and play with it. So, I felt like I was onto something in general. The key idea, though, is that this, this, this whole system of decision making ought to be powerful to handle all the ways that you may want to uh, interact with a decision. 
but simple enough to use, intuitive, immersive, kind of game-like as you do it. Drawing upon interactive visualization and a lot of collaborative and social dimensions. But also it's intelligent, it's got machine learning, it's got the ability to notice when someone does a decision that someone else has made that you want to suggest options or considerations that others have thought about before. So it should really handle all the complexities, but in a way that, that manages uh, to remain simple and support all the stakeholders, not just the person choosing, but the person who's being chosen. Have a way for the people that are being considered to opine about the choice and progress. I won't go into lots of details, but it's not just a tool, it's a system, right? It's got some sort of technology that lets you interact with these devices, but it's also full of context. So as it grows, it learns. You know, with the fifth, the 5,000th time, someone's making a choice about a, a camera or an apartment, the system knows what things people care about most typically. It can suggest them to you. You can say, other people have considered these things more important. There's some sort of collective wisdom. So you can build communities around it. Heavy emphasis on, on visual interaction, right? Different metaphors for different people, different kinds of learners, folks who want to engage with their choice. Uh, a lot of social dimensions. You, you can collaborate inside of a box as a team, or you can, you can access other teams that are made of the same. Intelligence, that it's dynamically reconfigurable. So as you interact with it, it notices which, which factors differentiate things the most, where you want to pay your attention to in the actual conversations with colleagues as you deliver it. Uh, but, the, but the basic metaphor is that we've got all this white noise that, that comes at us when we're making choices. Vendors, literature, fellow uh, uh, organizations that have dealt with it. How do you organize that into kind of an actionable spectrum of, of data? And that's my aspiration with this, this choice box and scheme. And it's also got this agenda for me of, of chooser liberation. Especially now, we're, we're so manipulated now by all the data that's collected about us. We're being constantly presented with web experiences that are, that are sculpted based upon surreptitiously gathered data about what we've done, what we search for, what our preferences are. And so if you could have an environment where people were enhanced in their autonomy because they could, in a privacy-respecting way, identify what they care about and how much, uh, it would be a positive step in the world. So we've had one um, concrete experience with so far a couple of years ago. The Legal Services Corporation held uh, a pair of national summits on technology, trying to decide how should we allocate our limited national funds to support technology in, in the legal aid system. And uh, they brought together about 50 or 60 judges, uh, executive directors, staff lawyers, <coughs> librarians, technologists, uh, other ac academics, and others, to brainstorm. And this first conference came up with like 50 ideas of things we should do, we might want to do. And, and maybe uh, 40 or 50 uh, uh, desiderata or criteria by which we might judge them. And so the question was, how do we, how do we make a, a, a responsible collective choice about where to spend, spend our money? So they, they engaged this choice box system. We built a custom environment for the process, and we had about 35 people sign up and do it. And they each went through, and we, we, we narrowed it down to about a dozen possible activities and about 10 uh, uh, objectives or criteria. And for each possible activity, like expert system, should LSC invest in, in expert system development? Well, there was various ways in which it was good. It empowers self-help, potentially. It's not especially affordable. Expert systems are kind of expensive. Um, it supports other things, reduces barriers, etc. But each person made their own judgments about the relative efficacy of a particular technology in relation to these objectives. Because we're trying to extract knowledge and sort of preferential wisdom from the crowd. So we do that for each person, for each thing. Each person would then have kind of this choice box where graphically would capture how, how, how much they thought something was enhanced effectiveness and how much they cared about that thing relative to other possible agendas. And then there was some sort of totaling up that to give you a sense of total impact. So each person would do that. It turned out not to be as painful as it might look. Uh, it was kind of fun. And then you got this kind of you got this virtual three-dimensional box that comes into existence, this data structure, across all the people involved, what they all think about the relative efficacy of all these different tools, out of which you can pretty quickly extract average. Uh, outcomes. So it became a, a fair, democratic, thoughtful way to come to some prioritization around 
important issues of, of, of resource allocation. So document assembly, the kind of tools that Jessica and colleagues are doing, doing at Chicago Kent, uh, emerged as a very high priority thing. All things considered, that seemed to give the most bang for the buck. But we had other, other criteria as well. Anyway, long story short, that's, that's the background. And finally, I'm getting around to trying to teach a course in which students would do this kind of stuff. And so the notion is, even though there are courses at law schools where you study decision making, uh, I haven't seen courses in which students build software applications to support decision making. So if anyone knows of that, I'd love to hear more about it. But that's part of it. It's really the, the idea of making things, making useful artifacts, in this case, to support people in making choices. Uh, the other thing that's going to be different about the course is we're going to explicitly look at a variety of, of ways to do this. We're going to look at tools like A to J and tools like document assembly systems. Can you support a choice well through that paradigm? To what extent does something like my choice boxing system work, do things better? I'm going to really try to engage students in critiquing it very hard. I want to get as much mm -hmm. negative critique as possible of what I've become uh, far too emboldened about. Uh, so the, the point is you can then apply this choice support concept across all these different aspects of what lawyers do. Client counseling, advocacy, negotiation, thinking about what are the choices in play? What are the options? How do I persuade someone to come to the outcome I want? How do I advise a client? How do I counsel a client to make a, a good choice for them? And there are about seven or eight underlying cognitive tests that are involved. We're doing balancing, we're doing comparison, prioritization, selection. All these things involve the same kind of cognitive act I'm describing of balancing alternative factors. Um, I'm going to probably have each class focus on a decision trap. Many of you read some of the literature about decision making. Uh, there, it's, it's amazing we ever make any good choices, <laughs> right? Because there's so many things we get wrong. We're just wired. We're not wired to make good, good choices. We're very uh, vulnerable to manipulation, right? And, and self-confusion, uh, self uh, not, not to mention just forgetting things and to be influenced and targeted in various ways more and more. So I think that's an important part about becoming a competent professional nowadays is being a good choice maker. For your own choices and other people's choices. Uh, so that's really, that's my, that's my agenda, that's my, my slides. So some questions on this, and then we can open it up more broadly. Yes? So as I'm watching this, it comes to mind like real estate agents. This would be like a perfect tool for them. I, I know we bought a house a few years ago, and he kept showing us houses that hit our tick list, but it didn't feel right. Yeah. And then I actually found a different house that had a few things that weren't on my tick list. But I like the view much better, and I didn't know I wanted a view until yeah. I saw the house I had a view. Yeah. Right, and uh, so, and that's the house that we bought. So I, you know, for months I drove this poor man insane, <laughs> and I think he probably, you know, and he probably plugged in, you know, this is what they think they want. So, um, mm. so how do you? There's always that human element at the end. Sure. You know. The, yeah, and, I, and this is not meant to substitute for for our emotions or our human yeah. judgment. But it's an aid. It's, it's sort yeah. of an externalization, you know, like a prosthesis of sorts that captures how we're thinking. And you can you can explicitly build into it emotional considerations. But for me, the, the exciting part is the way it, 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 it uh, allows us to discover things we didn't know we cared about. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. So, I, you know, having been in this, I, I see applicability everywhere. And I've been trying to stay away from law for the most part, uh, just because I've gotten tired of being with lawyers. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, coming back into law, it seems like there's a lot, a lot of applicability. So, and I'm amazed that there's not something like this in existence. So I'm really curious if anyone has seen this. Oh yes, somebody's already done it. Uh, right. What, what about case map? A uh, case map is a great technology for mapping litigation, right? For mapping cases, right. keeping track of the parties. It doesn't help you make choices per se. It doesn't explicitly model what option should I consider. It gives right. you the raw data. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so there's lots of auxiliary technologies, but the core act, I think, of balancing and choosing, to my mind, is not well supported by any obvious technology, let alone one that's widespread and easily available. Uh, did you have a question? You were shaking, you were moving. Uh, uh, Jessica. How are you going to have students tackle this project? Are they going to have like one justice problem or one issue that they're going to then make a, one of these choice boxes from? Or no, I'm thinking of having a distributed list. I mean, so like the courses you and I do, we have each student has has a, a different project. Mm -hmm. uh, like one student might be doing a Nebraska parenting plan, and someone else is doing a Massachusetts uh, consumer protection letter. In the case of document assembly, I'm going to have them go forth, and first of all, 
see what they can find online already. What, what decision support tools are out there you can find to help people make legal choices? And then critique them. What's good about it, what's bad about it? And then have each one choose a particular choice support application, maybe which, uh, which entity type for a startup. You know, should it be an LLC or a, or a corporation or a partnership or something? Which, whether they treat an employee as a contractor or as, or as an employee. And have each student, or maybe in teams, um, pick a, a decision support context and build an application. Choosing one or, one or more of the technologies we'll have available. And then do this kind of meta critique. I'm looking at, yeah, how does the underlying technology support or, or hinder this job of helping somebody make a choice? So that's, that's, that's what I'm thinking. But it's the first time it's going to be, it's going to be experimental. Other reactions? Yes. Can you talk a little bit more about the, the technologies that you're, that you're going to use to build out uh, this application? Uh, I saw you were talking about A to J, but is there anything else that uh, you were going to get looking at to build it out? Um, well, certainly A to J and Hot Docs or, or Rapid Docs document assembly technology, which, which can do a really good job of building an interactive questionnaire and guide some of the considerations. Where I find they, they both fail is the ultimate job of balancing. They don't. You know, I think you need some sort of visual representation close to what I have. That's that's my feeling. So some students may may have competence in Excel or, or some desktop products that they could they could try to do this in. Uh, we're, we hope to have our uh, um, uh, all about choice environment available for people to build boxes of the kind you saw there, kind of a interactive web uh, configuration process. But I'm open. I want to find out what what are the possible tools you could use for this kind of a job. And, and how do you compare them? How do you choose them both? Yes? Um, well, um, I was just wondering, like, you basically, I guess, added the third tier. And isn't there a problem? Like, I know like, when I create lists, the more things I add to it, the more confused I become. So, um, I mean, it's just complicating things some, more. Uh, There's definitely that danger. I mean, you know, the famous book by Barry Schwartz, The Paradox of Choice. Mm -hmm. the, more, the more choices you become aware of, you, you can tend to get paralyzed. And so that's, that's part of the discipline, I think, of, of, of learning how to be a competent choice maker is that you need to find, strike a happy medium between too little deliberation and too much. And I'm not sure the technology can help with that, but if it makes it as easy as possible for you to throw things in there and then, as, as importantly, suppress it. You, you, can, you can sort of suppress things that are so little differentiating that you really don't care about and then focus on the key things that you really do, do care about. I don't want to. I don't want to proselytize choice boxing. That's, I, I tend to do that, but in the academic context, I think this opens up an area of, of interesting decision making. Uh, and let's just talk more generally about about these curricula. Um, any other reactions to what Richard's doing? What I'm trying to do? Questions in general. Anyone doing anything like this at your at your at your schools? Do you have any uh, besides the ones we've mentioned? Vermont and, and Columbia and Chicago, Canada. Yes. Um, I just have a question for those who are doing it, and I asked this at like the lunch thing yesterday. Um, how did you get to have? I mean, someone mentioned that it's a voice with pay. So. I mean, you know, I got some good ideas yesterday, but with the more information about this, I we're at baby steps trying to do something like this, and I realize the value of it. But you know, how did you guys get started? You want to say anything? No, how did we get started teaching law practice? I mean, how did you get them to say, okay, yeah, you're How'd you get permission? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, well both, both of these institutions had made a commitment at a high level to move in this strategic direction as part of the positioning strategy for those law schools to attract even undergraduates at some point, you know, JDs. So they're going to build it into their marketing admission strategy training for 21st century practice. So it's and it was, down. Yeah, and it was uh, basically at a, at a strategy level to understand that this was going to become an important way of differentiating both. Both I'm talking about Suffolk Law School has a big commitment, and so does Florida Coastal, which is part of a network of three schools. I think how many schools here that you know of, uh, that you know in your own curriculums, that teach what we call law practice technology. Law practice technology is the technology of how to practice law, which is different, a different subject than introducing technology in the doctrinal curriculum, which we also think is really important too. So for example, if you're doing a course in the States and Trusts, you should be training <coughs> students on how to use the spreadsheet so that they can show a client different alternatives. And if you're doing something in damages, you need to be able to 
actually use you can use these choice tools so you make decisions among alternatives. So there's a technology component that could be introduced in every uh, in many of the doctrinal courses. But what we're talking about here is uh, really uh, uh, let's call it courses which help uh, in the delivery of legal services, the technology of the delivery of legal services, which normally is not within the uh, the mission of the law school. They don't deal with the delivery of legal services. They teach law, right? Yeah. That is. Thank you. I think it's going to be a combination of bottom up and top down, right? I mean, competitive pressure at some point may be on our side. This article Richard, Richard and I talked about is coming out in a few weeks. Top 10 law schools teaching law practice technology. You can bet those schools are going to you know, promote, that, yeah. promote that. And some other schools are going to say, wait a second, you know, what, we, we're doing some of this. How can we work listed? How can we not visible? Should we be considering things of this nature? And on the other hand, just people like you that take some initiative and say, all right, let's, let's try it. Let's do an experimental course. Let's, let's just do a, a section of this and see how it works. Right. Uh, I'm going to say some other things. I think if you haven't read Tomorrow's Lawyers, it's an important book to read because it talks about where careers are really evolving. When you look at Bill Henderson's projections of employment, the fastest growing employment sector in other legal organizations, Legal employment is flat, they were down with the law firms generally. So you have to look at the whole structure of the legal industry and how it's changing, in my view, and then devise strategies so that people, or some people, will be able to, in this kind of moving chairs, you know, thing, will survive and, and can create a career out of this. And these are skills that we think that people need, and you don't get it in the to Gap programs now, but that will come too at some point. A technology is, tra is completely transforming what we know to be law. There's a high information component of law. So, I have, you know, whether it's legal research or it's predictive uh, uh, coding or it's discovery, you can't no longer talk about law without talking about information technology. And that perception is not still widespread in the academy. You folks know this more than anybody else, so like in a way, talking to the converted. <laughs> I think you know you're the avenue uh, in, in which technology gets introduced into the law school institution, and also through clinical programs. Kind of yeah, so that's one of the things that I'm working on, right? How do we teach the academy right. mm. that this is important? <laughs> and um, you know, I went to AALS and I met with Julia Reen and the staff, and I said, "Look, we need to be talking more about this at our annual meetings." And um, we need to like figure out how to bring these ideas to the academy. So I guess one thing I'm interested in is any ideas, any other ideas about how to make that happen. Because it is really important. And I think that if law schools don't do it, we're going to lose part of the market. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I'm really concerned that, that the academy is going to lose part of the market because other Providers are going to come in and start training people to serve all these industries where you don't need a JD, and we're going to be playing catch up, and you can't play catch up against technology. Well, so there's some other big issue. there are some other points. The lessons of organizational change, first of all, right. is they usually set up another run group, another organization within the larger organization. Right. I, so that's like Clay Christensen. Correct. Right. Like IBM set up a separate company for personal computers, digital equipment, did and it died. So the, the lesson is always to set up something separate. That's mm. one. Secondly, teaching law practice technology the way we're doing it does not, does not threaten the doctrinal faculty. Let's say they're good at what they do. And also the lesson of change is they need to be continuing to do good at what they do. You know, that's what they get paid to do. So you have to, there is a structural issue in terms of how you introduce change into the organization, it seems to me. That's why we were very consistent of setting up a separate organizational group that didn't threaten the regular faculty as a set up for law practice technology. You may be able to do that within the clinics, but uh, depending on what kind of resources you have, you need to separate it, separate it out so it's not threatening. So you can build a beach out. It could be in the library. You know, you know, a lot of things you can do with it, right? The extension of those of those mm -hmm. programs. We have time for two more questions or comments, Jim. Uh, so a question about your decision matrix. Yes. Um, when, you're, when you're thinking about that, you, you talked on one hand about how everyone is guiding you when you're on the web and your choices are sort of being guided by what you did before and what others like you before. Mm. Just like Google tries to fill the line up for you while you're doing Right. Have you ever been to a, to a conference and you're 
you're typing whatever the speaker is looking at, and it automatically pops up because everyone else in the room is typing exactly mm -hmm. this. So, yeah. so those sorts of things are happening all over. Mm -hmm. Your tool is going to leverage those same things. How are you going to make it transparent? Well, the, the fact that you're guiding decisions, or at least trying to help them see options. As much as possible, make it make it an explicit, explicit offering in place. So, you know, if someone's making a choice, say, here are things other people can consider, you might want to consider, and give you as much data about.